Hi all. Our second instructive game today carries on the theme of pawn sacrifices, but in this game the world number one, Anand, is crushed with a D-pawn sacrifice. So this was played in the Grand Slam final tournament, which was just finished. In case you don't know, it's been staged in Bilbao, Spain. Well, it was staged between the 1st and the 13th of this month. It's a six-player double round robin event, one of the strongest in history apparently, with the average ELO being 2775, making it a category 22. Um, players actually have a different scoring system in this tournament. Three points is given for the win, one point for the draw, and zero for losing. So it's encouraging people to really go for it. So in this game, Topolov did, and he used a D4 pawn sacrifice. Sacking his d4, as, as we'll see. So after d4, Anand played knight f6. And after c4, Anand played e6. So seemingly rock solid and reliable Nimzo Indian defence. Toplov sidesteps with um, knight f3, aiming for the queen's Indian variations. After b3, he plays g3. So again, we have a similar kind of um, king's fianchetto as we've seen in the last two instructive games. But um, bishop a6 was played here. So black's keeping more fluid in the centre, not playing for d5, trying to win white's c pawn. White played um, queen c2, and after bishop b7, white played bishop g2. So what has black achieved with this bishop a6? The queen arguably is slightly misplaced on c2, and black can now pressure perhaps on d4, um, with moves like later with c5. In fact, black lashes out immediately with c5, trying to prove perhaps that the, c, the c2 queen is slightly misplaced, not defending as it was the d4 pawn. Now though, Topolov unleashes a d pawn sacrifice, so not caring about um, the queen not supporting the pawn, and in fact just sacking the pawn immediately, d5. So it's a disruptive pawn sacrifice, trying to generate um, a lot of pressure in some variations on this diagonal, but also by undermining black's um, e6 pawn, you know, the f5 square proves to be a dangerous resource as well, as we're about to see. So after e takes d5, c takes, and then takes the pawn. So the world number one sees no fear here. Topolov castles, so seemingly, you know, a casual move. Just perhaps, you know, what would, what would happen, for example, if black just chased the queen? Well, white doesn't have to worry here too much, because queen um, d1 or queen a4, and, you know, this knight's going to be kicked back, and if white gets in knight c3, white seems to have good positional compensation. But let's not go too much into detail here. Black played bishop e7. After rook d1 and queen c8, white now actually stopped this pesky knight, B, B4 possibility just by playing A3. So what has white got for the uh, the pawn deficit? Well after the knight F6 apparently an innovation was unleashed in this position. The usual move was knight C3 but actually bishop G5 was played in this game and after D5 white voluntarily gave up immediately his dark squared bishop to exert now pressure immediately on d5, and this is slightly tricky for black. For example, if black had played now d4, then knight b5 now threatens to fork the queen and king. So what does black do about this d6 issue? And, you know, if black, say, castles, then we see the problem of this diagonal now highlighted. Say so knight takes, queen takes, now knight g5, actually also threatens queen takes h7 mate as well as attacking the queen. So black has some severe problems in this variation with this threat of knight d6. And if bishop e7, there's a very interesting resource here, tactical resource, which justifies the whole thing and leaves white much better here. I wonder if you can spot it. I'll give you five seconds actually, starting from now. The resource in this variation is knight takes d4, as if takes, queen takes c8, bishop takes, and again this diagonal is being exploited. Knight takes d4, big advantage to white. So this has been a startling innovation by Topolov, and 
in this position, after knight c3, Topolov actually um, didn't, didn't, uh, wasn't facing d4. So Aland, you know, he really didn't like this position. What he did was immediately give up his dark square bishop. So Topolov took on c3. But now we see the other downside of black taking on that d5 um, square. This e6 pawn is no longer there to protect this critical f5 point. And as, as I've mentioned, statistically, in a lot of games, you know, if you can get a knight to f5, you're often winning the game. And in this position, Topolov steered his knight for f5. He played knight h4, coming into that critical uh, square. So after g6, Anand is weakening his dark squares a bit, and he hasn't got that dark squared bishop. Also, look at this knight. It's not really doing much. So here white's got big compensation and in fact can actually just regain the pawn now. So it ends up with a strategically um, you know, much better position. And at this level, this is really, really dangerous to give to a player like Topolov. After rook a d1, just simply doubling up rook, securing pressure on the d line. And the white queen can just brutally go in for a straightforward attack, potentially, on these dark squares. So black's in real trouble now. And then played knight c7, so rook d7, another logical, simple, positional and crushing move. Just rook on the 7th, exerting actually immediate tactical pressure in some variations on the f7 pawn. After knight e6, queen e4, the queen's coming in for the kill. So um, potentially it can go to e3 to h4, or knight f3 and queen h4 with the threat in some variations of knight g5. In the game... Queen e8, and the knight came back now to f3. So the queen's movement to e4 supports queen h4. All quite brutal and direct, but justified because white controls the d file. Black hasn't got easy counterplay here. In fact, let's have a look if black could, could have played something like rook d8 here. Rook d8. Calling to Ribka, white gets a big advantage with queen b7 on initial analysis. So if rook takes, rook takes, white's got a clearly um, better position. In fact, in this kind of position, rook takes f7 is on. If the, if the queen's a liability, a tactical liability. So black is struggling here, and Anand's actually played c4. So with c4, he's trying to give his, his knight a square on c5. But um, Topolov moves in for the kill with his queen, so queen h4. And also there's the threat now introduced of rook e7. The queen also supports this diagonal. So rook e7 and perhaps doubling up rooks on the 7th rank is threatened. And then played knight c5 anyway, allowing rook e7. And here, Anand tried to offer his queen for two rooks by playing rook d8. And there's an unusual move played here by Topolov. He's not interested in winning Black's queen for two rooks. What he played, actually, was a mysteriously, you know, looking passive kind of move, rook f1, which I was a bit puzzled by when I first saw this game. But actually, on deeper analysis, it's reducing the tactical liability of that unprotected rook in some variations. Because in some variations, Black's going to be playing queen a4 and rook d1 check. So if the rook is like on any of these squares, that would be check. And even if it's not, if it was on e1, it would be a tactical vulnerability. So by playing rook f1, the king is nicely supporting that rook, if needed, in key variations. And actually, because of this menacing threat of knight g5, Allen felt he had to resign here. So let's try and explain at least this resignation. Let's have a look at queen a4 with the idea of at least, you know, in some variations, to play rook d1. Now here, why is it so crushing for white? Well, knight g5 threatens that mate, and black would be forced to play the horrible-looking h5. But here, can you spot the crushing move, which Anand must have seen to cause his immediate resignation? I'll give you five seconds starting from now. The crushing move, I believe, is knight takes f7. Because if rook takes f7, then white plays rook takes f7, and the queen is hitting that rook. So white will be the exchange up here. Black has no adequate reply here. And, you know, if...
black say move the rook somewhere then this is completely hopeless because queen f6 now threatening actually queen h8 mate and look you know the king is protecting that rook so this taking on f1 is harmless and in this kind of variation queen d5 would seem to be a resource but f3 is sufficient so if rook takes f7 here again black's ending up getting mated on these dark squares so king h7 rook h8 mate if rook f8 then rook takes f8 or queen takes f8 so this is all pretty hopeless for black in this position and this is why Anand, the world number one, came to a crashing um, defeat. Please leave any comments on YouTube. Thanks very much.